Yeah. 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 Ye
until Captain Cook journeyed down there as part of his scientific expedition in 1769. When humans first came to New Zealand, they found a world very different in the way from the, the point of view of looking at the animal life. Um, New Zealand doesn't have, with the exception of two living species of bats, they don't have any mammals. Uh, they, they originally had a, a third species of bat, uh, and that is now extinct. So there are no um, foxes and creatures like that. All the mammals we see there today are imported. So, but it was very rich in bird life, and they had some of the most incredible bird life. Uh, one of them was the uh, moa, and you can get an idea of how large these creatures standing by. This is Rich, Richard Owen, a very famous anatomist and zoologist of the 1800s. And you can see the size of this skeleton. Absolutely huge. And <clears throat> keep in mind, you're looking at something that doesn't have the flesh and the feathers on top as well. And here we've got a comparison to the moa next to a full-grown ostrich and a little kiwi there as well. Just to give you a size comparison. Mm -hmm. So there were these incredibly large birds that had evolved over time without humans. So they didn't really have that fear of humans. And the unfortunate thing, when people first came into New Zealand, here was a very good food source that didn't have a fear of humans. So they estimate that they actually became extinct within about 100 years. It's a very short period of time. Uh, the result of that were that predators like Haas eagle here, which was the largest eagle that ever lived, uh, that became extinct very quickly as well. So a lot of the native fauna now are, tends to be a lot of smaller birds uh, left on the island. The other thing that happened was uh, when the Māori people turned to farming, and in particular farming the kumara, the, the sweet potato, they um, cleared a lot of land. They, they estimate about one third of the land was cleared for farming. And then when Europeans came in, they cleared at least another third. Right? So conditions changed uh, very, very quickly. <clears throat> As most of you will be aware, uh, New Zealand is a volcanic wonderland. Um, active volcanoes, geysers, mud pools, uh, you know, quite interesting when we compare it to Australia, which is volcanically dormant. Uh, we don't get all that activity. And so uh, it's a fascinating place to compare. And while I was looking at guys like this, I was thinking of worlds like Io, uh, one of Jupiter's moons, and Enceladus, and Triton, one of uh, the moons further out, uh, where they have these active geysers now. So we can uh, look at these areas and make comparisons. Um, the reason I've got these two photos in here is this lady, this was in a, a Māori village called uh, Ohinimutu, and uh, this is her backyard, this is what she's got in her backyard. She's got this huge uh, pool of uh, cauldron of water boiling away, and it's a fascinating place to go to a, a village or a town where there's just steam coming out of the ground everywhere, it's, it's quite uh, different. Uh, but the, the sad thing about this is she said she has to keep an eye on her backyard because she keeps keeps on getting people jump in every couple of years committing suicide in a backyard in this hot water. Now I can think of a far better way to sort of if I wanted to off myself than jumping in hot water. But that's what happens. So she said if she sees anyone in pyjamas near the pool she gets quite worried, quite concerned. <laughs> the other reason I've got this photo here is this gentleman here, his name is Wes, and um, <clears throat> as you do when you're travelling you meet people and bump into people and start chatting to people and he asked me about my jacket because I had a jacket with all space patches and it turned out this guy, him and his wife were visiting from the US, he actually worked on the Apollo program. And uh, he was one of the head welding technicians on the lunar module. Uh, and I don't think I'd ever met anyone that had worked on the Apollo program firsthand like that. So we had a really good conversation because we went on a, a boat tour of this area. So you just never know who you're going to bump into uh, when you're travelling. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, one of the things about Australia is there uh, a common misconception is that Aboriginal Australians had one large homogenous language and most of you would likely be aware that's not the case. There were at least 270 distinct Aboriginal languages with dialectual diversity we have about 600 different language groups. In New Zealand it's a little bit the opposite. It's a little bit of a misconception that it's one large homogenous language it is one large language, but there is a lot of dialectual diversity. But they told me there that if uh, a person came from the top of the North Island, met a person from the South Island down the bottom, they'd be able to understand each other, all right? So there are, uh, one thing to keep in mind, there are different words, different naming for things, but essentially they'd be able to have a conversation, 
All right. So the reason I point this out as well is because if there's diversity in language groups, often there's diversity when we look at the, the sky. There can be different stories. And certainly within Māori culture, there are lots of different stories that relate to the night sky. In fact, when I started putting this PowerPoint together, you know, there were so many different names for the Milky Way and so many different names for the Southern Cross. So it was a case of which one do I use? So I, I went mostly for the, the common, most common one. Um, the different tribal groups in New Zealand are called iwi, uh, and here you can see that if you look at the South Island and the North Island, there were lots of different uh, language areas uh, here in comparison to the South Island, which was not as heavily uh, populated. All right, so most of the population, I guess, were on the North, maybe because it was a little bit warmer. Who knows? The um, <clears throat> The uh, group I spent a little bit of time up in here, uh, where that village was up in Rotorua, is up in that area there. Auckland, the largest city, would be up here, and Wellington is just down the bottom there. Um, it was funny, when I was uh, heading over there, everyone was saying, we don't go to Christchurch because they've had this big earthquake. And I knew very little about uh, Wellington, so I had a look at Wellington on Wiki and, and so on. And the biggest earthquake ever in New Zealand's history was in Wellington. Uh, and they tell me they're way overdue for another one. And so. Uh, 8.7 or something they estimated the one in, in uh, Wellington in the 1800s. <clears throat> so here we see again uh, just the different tribal areas, the iwi, and uh, a comparison with different Aboriginal group or language areas uh, in Australia there as well. Now there's been a resurgence in Maori culture in, in recent years and I think one of the, the things that's helped preserve a lot of Māori culture is that, that uh, one language. Uh, the problem with a lot of uh, Aboriginal groups in Australia is that if a small group uh, felt susceptible to a, to a pathogen, pathogen disease, uh, that group could uh, very quickly be wiped out and that knowledge went as well. Where in Māori culture, because the language was still there, essentially things were still uh, passed on. The, um, so there's been a resurgence in uh, tattooing. Uh, I was quite surprised to see uh, uh, lots of people with ta full face tattoos, which they call the moko. Um, the, um, this is a, a whare, which is a meeting house. Now there is a lot of uh, astronomical significance to these as well, which I'm not going to go into this in, within this talk because it's actually quite complex. But just to say that uh, in the uh, whare would be the place where younger members of a group, a tribal group, would come in and that information about the night sky would be exchanged between people, all right? Oh, incidentally, if you have any questions as I'm talking, please feel free to interrupt me during the, the session rather than wait to the end. <coughs> so how do, how does a group pass on knowledge? I mean, we, we now, if we pass on knowledge, I would go to the library, I would come to a lecture, an astronomical lecture maybe, I would uh, Google, you know, there are lots of different ways we pass on knowledge now. However, in uh, times before, uh, with a, particularly with uh, indigenous groups that don't use, uh, didn't use a written script, for example, uh, the way to pass on knowledge was through uh, oral narration, through storytelling. Uh, another way may be uh, through dancing as well and through art. So you've got this great cosmic storyboard in the sky and so this was a very good way of pointing out different shapes and patterns to be able to tell stories and pass on knowledge. And as astronomers, most of us still do that. You know, we'll talk about the Southern Cross. We might talk a little bit more about some of the scientific aspects relating to the Southern Cross. But we certainly still pass on stories. <clears throat> and as someone who gets to speak to groups quite a lot, I've got, often found the best way to pull someone into astronomy is to tell them a story whether it's classical mythology or whatever, it often uh, pulls the bridge in and that gathers their interest rather than hit them with a the hard scientific fact uh, straight away. <coughs> and also within Maori culture, as I mentioned, the moko, the tattooing, was a way that uh, knowledge was passed on. And I was told that uh, in the early days, uh, a, if a, a guy walked into a village, uh, that other village would know all about that person just by their tattoos. That would pass on uh, information. <clears throat> so the Māori actually had dedicated astronomers, if you like, uh, night sky watchers, uh, called uh, Tohunga Kokorangi. And uh, so they spent, in fact I was reading a story about a guy that used to sit out there 
in the 1800s, seven hours each night just watching the sky. And so he was the keeper of that knowledge. Uh, you know, in a situation where you don't have books to go to and you don't have um, the um, computer to go to, I would go to that person. So Robert here might be the keeper of the knowledge relating to the Southern Cross. And Paul here might be the keeper of the knowledge relating, relating to Orion and so on. So if you wanted to know something about that particular uh, constellation or area of the sky, you'd go to that person and discuss it with that person. <coughs> so as I mentioned, the, the Māori were able to navigate the world's largest ocean by looking at the stars. And I've been conversing with a, one of the Māori elders via email recently and I asked him, look, you know, how did they take those measurements? And for the most part, they probably just used their hands. Uh, a lot like we do sometimes as well, when they hold their thumb out and they get a rough idea how high above the horizon a certain star would be. Canopus, the second brightest star in the night sky, was one star they used quite a lot. And when the Southern Cross was down really low, uh, and, and the Southern Cross would be about 10 degrees above the horizon from this area, uh, this was a way they could use the night sky uh, to be able to navigate. And this was crucial to survival. I mean, you didn't want to go out when it was bad weather. You needed to have a very good knowledge of weather patterns. <clears throat> and the same applies in Australia, where the Aboriginal people that lived in the very arid environments needed to know what foods were growing at a certain time of year. They also needed to know uh, what animals were breeding at a certain time of year. So a very good way of doing this was looking at the night sky <coughs> and being able to monitor the uh, night sky. Uh, iwi, the literal translation for iwi is bone. This means like white bone. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if we're going to talk about um, Māori knowledge of the night sky, we also need to think a little bit about their cosmology, or their cosmogony. And um, if I was to ask uh, Tony Beresford, wherever he's sitting out here, and uh, say, Tony, can you teach me about cosmology? Uh, today, Tony will talk about the Big Bang, and he might talk about um, the expansion and redshifts and, uh, and so on. If you were to talk to uh, a Māori person, particularly in the past, about cosmology, they would talk about their ancestors and their uh, ancestral beings and so on, their gods. And they believe that in, uh, in the beginning, there was a type of energy which they called Te Kōra. And Te Kōra was a place uh, that was basically a dark place where there was a, a, a clump of energy and that energy started to contract. And out of that clump of energy, the first two primal parents were born, and they're called Anganui and Papatuanuku. And so this was the place where the first gods were said to have been created. Now these, this couple were very much in love, so they were in a very tight embrace. <clears throat> and they actually uh, gave birth to 70, around, <coughs> excuse me, 70 different gods. All of these gods are male, incidentally. So the, the females were created mainly by uh, his wife, teaching the sons how to make females out of the red clay of the earth. So <clears throat> these gods were not able to see out beyond their parents because they were compressed between the two parents. So when their parents were moving about, they got a bit of a glimpse of the outside world. And what happened as a result was the, the kids wanted to see more. So they tried to prize the two parents apart. And different gods tried, tried and had no success. Eventually, one of them actually got poles and pushed the father, uh, Ranganui, up into the sky. And he's somewhat like um, the Egyptian sky goddess Nook, which I'll mention a little bit more about uh, later. So all of these gods were eventually able to separate the parents, and the, uh, the parents were very upset by this. In fact, they talk about uh, when you see the rain, these are the, the tears of uh, Ranganui crying for his wife. And she's now the earth goddess, Papa Tuanuku. So these, these um, uh, primal gods were uh, created in Te Pōa, and Te Pōa was the area where this energy was separated, and Te Pōa is the darkness, and this is where the demigods in uh, Māori uh, uh, cosmology reside. <clears throat> now there is, so we, we think of uh, Māori cosmology as three nesting spheres, if you like, and Te Ao uh, Marama is the area where we are, where uh, humans are. And uh, so the demigods, if you like, the gods that the, the gods of the forest, the gods of the sea, and so on, uh, reside in Te Pōa. The primal parents are in Te Pōa, and we reside in this area here. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. All right. 
So I mentioned Ranganui. Now Ranganui and Papa Tuanuku normally just get shortened to Rangi and Papa. All right, just so you know who I'm talking about. And here are some of the gods uh, they created. As I mentioned, they're all male. Uh, names like Tafiti Matia, for example. Um, Tangaroa, god of the sea, and so on. The, uh, now, there are lots of different stories about the separation of uh, Rangi and Papa, and they vary from Iwi to Iwi. The general name given to the sun is uh, Tera, which is uh, interesting because the Egyptian uh, sun is normally referred to as Ra or Re. Uh, Ti or Te is just the. So the, the Māori actually called the sun Ra, the exactly the same name used by the ancient Egyptians. And they have somewhat of a similar view. You know, I mentioned that uh, Rulangi, the father, was placed into the sky and the stars are attached to his body. A cloak was actually made for him. And the sun was placed in his belly button in the sky. And here we see a, an example of the Egyptian sky goddess Nut, a somewhat similar story, where she swallows the sun uh, and through the 12 hours of the night, the sun passes through her body and eventually reborn through the birth canal in the morning. All right. So a very interesting comparison between the, the uh, two groups, somewhat similar. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the moon is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is named uh, Marama. The, uh, the stars are Fetu. The WH is normally pronounced more like a, a, an F to us in English. And Fetu R is the, uh, referring to planets in general, although there are lots of different names for uh, individual planets. <clears throat> now the, the hard thing about looking when you look at Māori night skies is that uh, we think of a, a constellation today with boundaries. Now the constellations we use today were finalised in 1922 by the International Astronomical Union uh, at the inaugural meeting they had in uh, Rome. And that was put into publication in 1930 by a guy called Eugene uh, Delforte. So we have fixed boundaries with the 88 constellations we use today. With Māori constellations, that's not the case. And the, not only that, the thing that I find really confusing is that a star like, let's say, for example, uh, Sirius, which they call Takarua, uh, when it's in one part of the sky, it may have one name, but when it's on the other side of the sky, it could have a completely different name. All right? And not only that, it can t assume the name of an, uh, another star that's on that side of the sky. So you need to know what time of year it is to know what to call that star. But in general here, I've gone for the, the uh, most commonly used name. Now, the Milky Way generally is called uh, Tiakaroa, and Tiakaroa is what they refer to as the giant fish. Mm -hmm. They're most certain, I know, a, I know a, a whale is a mammal, but most certainly they're referring to whales. So they see, see this, one of the depictions is like a giant whale, that band of the Milky Way in the sky. And some of you who've uh, been out to Stockport and places might be able to see the Aboriginal emu in there as well, just while we're on that slide. The head of the emu there, the neck, the body, and the legs, just there. One of the first times I saw the Aboriginal emu was out at Stockport, and it really does look very spectacular under dark skies. It's well worth uh, having a look at. And there's a depiction of the whale seen in the sky there. So Tia Karoa is normally translated as the big fish. Now most of these artworks incidentally have been done by Richard Hall, who uh, with his partner Kay Leather uh, have quite uh, extensively researched uh, Māori night sky knowledge. And uh, I've got a picture of the book they wrote in here as well. <clears throat> Māori was a, a, an ancestral hero that uh, was said to have pulled up the uh, North Island with his, uh, when he was out fishing one time. And hopefully most of you have seen the scorpion in the sky. This is, the, this is where uh, the star Antares would be. And the long body of the scorpion comes down like this. So this is seen as Maui's hook in the sky. This is one way of seeing the scorpion. Can you all see that shape there? So the claws of the scorpion would be up through these stars up across like that. And the scorpion is one of those really nice constellations that does really look like a scorpion. This is the book Work of the Gods, if you've got an interest in uh, Māori Night Sky knowledge. It's not a very uh, thick book, but it's got a lot of information. If you ever decide to buy a copy of this, uh, Amazon is always very cheap to buy books uh, from, 
but they, they're selling them for about $125 on Amazon. Uh, but the people that actually um, at uh, Stonehenge and Aotearoa, uh, they sell them for $25. So get on the web, and they're the actual authors. Get on the web and you can uh, buy one of them for $25. <laughs> a bit of a difference in price. Now I mentioned the star Canopus. Now Canopus, as most, most of you are aware, is the second brightest star in the night sky. It, um, it varies from, uh, I think the last time I read it's uh, considered to be about 312 or so light years away. It's an extremely bright star, important to many, many cultures. The uh, Māori referred to this star as Atutahi, and he's seen as the lord of the southern sky. So he's the protector of the southern skies. And in fact, there is a, uh, a large waka, and a waka is a large Māori canoe in the sky, and it's related to a character called Tamaraniti, and he's actually in this canoe. And when the Southern Cross, there's the Southern Cross there at its lowest point, the two pointers out from the Venus and Tori. When the Southern Cross is really low and Canopus is high, you can see that it, there he is pulling up the uh, anchor. And they call the anchor Te Punga, which is the Southern Cross. And most of you know the Southern Cross because it's on our flag, the flag of New Zealand, Western Samoa, Papua New Guinea, and uh, Brazil. <coughs> now, Sirius is generally referred to as Pakarua, as uh, I mentioned earlier. Here we see a picture of Sirius taken by the Lick Observatory um, in, uh, I'm not sure when that was taken exactly, his companion, the pup Sirius B, which was the first white dwarf, I believe, found in 1832 or something, Tony, is that correct? Around then. And um, Sirius is referred to as Pakarua, and it features again in lots of stories that uh, relate to the night sky. Uh, in this photo, you can see the scorpion. There's the scorpion's claws there, the body coming around to the tail, and the stinger. And that star is called Rewa. And these are the two guardians of the seasons. And uh, any of you that have been out and looked at the night sky will know that with the scorpion setting now on the horizon, uh, once the scorpion starts to get down, Orion will be rising, okay, on the eastern horizon. And when Orion sets in the west, uh, the Orion will, uh, sorry, when Orion sits in the west, the scorpion will always be rising on the um, eastern horizon. Because the story goes in classical mythology, when Orion was stung by the scorpion, they were placed at opposite ends of the heavens. Now, the belt stars of Orion in generally uh, are referred to as Taltaru, and they've been seen lots of different ways. <coughs> One is regarded that there are four posts that are holding uh, Ranganui up in the sky. One of them is under his neck, um, and his neck actually rests on these three stars here. The other two, one, uh, the Matariki, the um, Pleiades, the uh, M45, are holding up one shoulder, and uh, Tautaru, I beg your pardon, uh, Takarua, the star Sirius, is holding up his other shoulder in the sky. His feet are being held up by the scorpion's tail, and you'll see when the scorpion going down overnight now, actually is up and curved like that, and it's said because there's so much weight holding his feet that the stars have actually bent over. Mm -hmm. Any questions at this point? <clears throat> now you know that uh, we have two orbiting satellite galaxies, the uh, large and the small Magellanic clouds, named after the explorer Ferdinand Magellan, who uh, journeyed south in 1519. The, uh, the large cloud uh, they call Kokiki, and uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud is about 170,000 light years away. So keep in mind when you see that light, that light left there around about the time that modern humans appear in the fossil record. So it's a very old light indeed. The Small Magellanic Cloud is about 230,000 light years away, and it's called Tikata Kata. All right? And you'll notice in this beautiful photo here, you've got the globular cluster 47 Takani, which is actually one of my favourites. Uh, they often talk about Omega Centauri being the best globular in the sky. I find 47 Takani a little bit better, just that it's really well defined. And, uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen that. Alright, this is uh, where I get you guys to do a little bit of work. Who knows what area of sky, what constellation we might be looking at there? <coughs> now ignore that object there. That, uh, to give you a clue, that's a planet obviously going through that area. There. No, it's not the Southern Cross. It's actually Virgo. That's the star Spiker there. And this is the Diamond Virgo. It actually became, 
becomes really hard to see constellations when there are so many other stars in there. That's the diamond of Virgo, just in there. And there, that that uh, Lynn was probably thinking was the Southern Cross there's the constellation Corvus the Crow. All right? And Corvus is sitting directly in front of um, the Southern Cross pretty well. The um, this uh, Virgo from memory is the second largest, I think, uh, constellation of the 88 constellations. So it takes in a very big area. Uh, the, the maiden herself, her head is marked by this star here, Zabijava, and her body comes through like this, and an arm out to Spica, another arm out to Binda Beatrix, that star there, and her legs come down through, through this area here. Now, I mean, I've been looking at this for 20 years, but if you can see a maiden in there, <laughs> you're doing pretty damn good. Um, I mean, even after a few glasses of wine, I don't see maidens in there. But, <laughs> the, um, but we usually do point out this shape. And as you can see, Spiker is named as uh, Muddy Owl uh, by uh, many of the groups. And a little bit of scientific information about Spiker as well. I actually forgot how hot Spiker is. It's a B-class star. And uh, we often take it for granted when we look at these stars. And, and you know, we see stars like Betelgeuse, which are quite cool. Uh, but but Spike is one of those that's really up there as far as being very, very uh, hot. <clears throat> now here's a little bit of a revision of this area. This is another depiction of the, uh, the Walker or the, the Milky Way when it's uh, coming up. And you'll see the three belt stars of uh, Orion there. There's that saucepan shape in there. Uh, Puanga is the star Rigel in Orion, and the legs of Orion would be here. The shoulders of Orion would be here, the head in here. And right around uh, through the sky, this is seen as a giant walker, a giant canoe. And if you've never seen a Māori walker, they're absolutely huge. Mm. They're really huge and very, very long. I'd seen some smaller ones in museums, but I hadn't seen the full-size ones. And they hold an awful lot of people. So a lot of the stars in the Milky Way have names relation, in relation to who's in that canoe. <clears throat> so this part, in one depiction, is seen as the the uh, back part of the canoe, the stern, coming up through the water where uh, Tauteru is, three stars. And if you go out, this is the perfect time of year to see it, late at night when Orion's coming up now, uh, these stars, as I mentioned, mark the, the stern, and it goes all the way around the southern horizon with uh, Te Punga, the uh, southern cross marking the anchor, down low, and you go right around to the west, and you'll see the, um, the curving tail of the scorpion, and that make, marks the prow sticking out of the water of the, the walker in the sky. So it's probably the largest constellation I've come across in area. It's, it's very large in uh, D. Oops, I'll give you hitting the wrong uh, button there, that's better. No, I've gone backwards, sorry. <clears throat> Some of the other names relating to uh, the night sky, the star Altair is Paltadangi. And Paltadangi actually marks out one of their months. The uh, Māori used a, uh, a lunar calendar. Now, how they compensated uh, for seasons and that, I'm not sure. The ancient Egyptians used to use a lunar calendar originally as well. I mean, we, we now know we use the civil year of 365 and a quarter days. And with a lunar calendar, you end up with, what is it, 354 days? So you end up 11 days short. Um, but this was, uh, Paltadangi was the marking of one of their uh, seasons. And I believe this is the time when they'd harvest food and so on. The fifth brightest star in the sky is Vega or Fainui. And we can see uh, Vega will be down in this area here. Altair, if, for those of you that don't know, is a star in the constellation of Aquila the Eagle. It's about 17 light years away. It's a, uh, a fairly uh, close star. Probably the most important grouping of stars now in uh, contemporary Māori culture is the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, uh, which they refer to as uh, Matariki. And the Matariki, they sit about 378 light years away. I'm sure most of you have seen them many times. Uh, the Matariki were important because when they first, the first Heliac rising, when they had their first dawn rising, this was the time when the Māori would start their uh, new year, all right? So when uh, Tauteru, the three bell stars of Orion, would start to set and the Pleiades would start to rise at the end of uh, roughly May, I think it is, the, in the morning, 
Uh, this was the time they looked for the first thin crescent moon, and that was the start of the uh, Māori New Year. So they still celebrate the uh, Matariki uh, today, and you see, you see the name around the place uh, quite a lot. All right, who knows what constellation we're looking at here now? Gemini. Gemini, very good. There's Pollux and Castor, the two bright stars of Gemini, part of the crew of, in classical mythology, uh, Ar uh, of Argo Navis, the, uh, with um, uh, the, uh, the ship in the sky. And the two twins lay side by side through these stars just here. Also, so, some names that relate to these stars in the sky. Um, Pollux is a star, I think it's an orange giant, about 34 light years away. Castor is made up of six different stars, and uh, Castor sits about 52 light years away. So again, these are fairly bright stars and fairly close stars. What about this area of sky? I'm just making sure no one's snoring, keeping <laughs> people awake. Taurus. It is Taurus, and there's Taurus the bull there, the Hyades cluster, the uh, bright orange giant star, uh, Aldebaran. It marks the eye. Of the, now remember, Aldebaran is a foreground star. The Hyades sit about 150 or so light years away. Aldebaran is only about 65 light years away. The, uh, as you can see, Aldebaran is known as Talmata Kuku. Uh, Talmata, when I was researching this, seems to mean something on top or at height. So I think what they're referring to is uh, when it's at its highest point in the sky. And as mentioned, the Pleiades cluster, uh, the Matariki. And again, you can see that uh, Aldebaran is a reasonably cool star at a, at a K-class star just there. A little bit of a review of this area. The, uh, I'm not exactly sure what uh, Waka Aku means. Um, I couldn't find a lot about it, and the people I spoke to didn't seem to know a lot about it as well. Uh, Pariahu is uh, the planet Saturn drawn in this picture here. Again, these uh, artworks have been done by Richard Hall. You can see the uh, stern of the boat drawn up here in the belt stars of Orion, as we mentioned, Kuanga, uh, Takua, Sirius, and so on. And so this is the morning sky looking north in January at around 12 a.m. If we look towards the south in January at around 5 a.m., we've got now uh, the, uh, the uh, Southern Cross up high, Kipunga. Uh, Canopus is over in the other part of the sky towards the uh, southwest and uh, starts to set up Tahi, who's the guy who's holding on to that line. And uh, he, Raumaki, and he, uh, Takarua, is talking about where the sun sets and so on, which I'll talk a little bit more about when we uh, talk about Stonehenge. Uh, the evening sky after sunset in mid-May. The reason I've got this one in here is because this is the uh, what they call the the post of Hini, Hini Nui Tipo. And Hini Nui Tipo is the Māori god of death. She's the goddess of the underworld. And often when we look at uh, classical mythologies and so on, the uh, goddesses of uh, death or the gods of death are, known, uh, are looked at as bad places, where in Māori culture it's not the case. She's actually the person who welcomes uh, people when they die or said to die. And uh, so it's actually quite a good thing. And her post that grounds um, the sky to the underworld is said to be when Orion is in this position when it's starting to set in the west in, uh, in mid-May, that's her post coming up through the ground right up to the star Sirius. So you can see what I mean about Sirius and Orion and the scorpion being seen different ways at different times of the year. It can become somewhat confusing and um, uh, it can vary quite a lot between iwi as well. All right, who's gonna pick this part of the sky? This one's probably a little bit harder. Well, it's okay, he's on top. Uh, not quite. No. This is actually the boots. fourth. Yes, who said boots? Very good. Uh, boots or bootes, the star Arcturus, the fourth brightest in our sky, just there. Uh, boots is the bear herder in classical mythology coming down through these stars uh, like this. Now, um, this is called Tulu, and uh, most of you will be aware that Arcturus is a star that's about 37 light years away. Our sun will swell up and become an orange giant, very much like uh, Arcturus in the future. Again, a K-class star, not like uh, Aldebaran 
and uh, so on. Funnel hoot or funnel hout, depending on your pronunciation. Atamanaru uh, cow, I think it's pronounced something like that. The um, again, this uh, funnel hoot's a very close start, 25 light years away, a little hotter than our sun at 8,750 uh, Kelvin, and also a star that's been interesting to astronomers because it has a, po a protoplanetary disk around it, and, and uh, astronomers look at this quite a lot. All right, we're going to leave the stars there and just go through some of the names of the planets. Not a lot on the planets, and I don't know a lot about what uh, the perception of the Māori were of planets, but certainly they knew they, they moved differently and so on. And if you look at classical mythology, the planets were normally given names of the gods because they were able to, they were powerful, they were able to move independently of other stars. So uh, I would say it's somewhat similar in uh, Māori cultures there. Again, you can see names. It was hard to choose a name because in so many different iwis, unlike the stars where there were lots of similar names with uh, stars, the uh, different iwi had lots of different names relating to the planets. We mentioned the Earth is uh, Papa, we know all about the Earth. And again, one of the things I noticed with Mars, Mars had lots of traditional names, but I've noticed in recent times they've given the Māori war god name, not this name here, to uh, Mars, which is a contemporary thing. Uh, and they've obviously adopted that because we refer to Mars as the, uh, the Roman war god. And because we knew that in warfare blood was shed and Mars was uh, the colour of like a drop of blood in the sky, they associated it with their war god. And lots of uh, Middle Eastern cultures associate Mars with uh, war as uh, well. The largest planet you can see, Ranga Fenua. The uh, Ranga or Rangi is normally referring to the sky. All right. <coughs> and Saturn, we mentioned a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, Pari Ara Aru. Some of those names are with the tongue twisters for me. All right. Now, while I was there, the reason I went over to New Zealand, because of the Rugby World Cup, uh, the Carter Observatory in Wellington uh, wanted to do, because of all the different countries coming like South Africa and Australia and so on, they wanted to do indigenous themes of the night sky. So I was asked to talk about uh, Abri Australian Aboriginal night sky uh, knowledge. And so while I was there, I thought this is a great opportunity. I hired a car and drove around the place and stayed an extra week. And one of the places I wanted to visit was uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa. Aotearoa is the, the Maori name for New Zealand, all right? And they built a complete working model of uh, Stonehenge. The only thing with this one, it actually works, uh, unlike the, the modern Stonehenge. Um, this is um, probably about an hour north of uh, Wellington. It uh, was built by the Phoenix Astronomical Society. These, uh, these um, pillars here, uh, they're about three metres high, and with the lintels on top, you've got close to another metre. So they're about three and a half to four metres high. In the centre, you've got a five metre uh, obelisk, and you've got an analemma just in that area there. Uh, these stones here are known as the Matariki stones, and so when you stand on this point here, and you line these stones up with another stone, which I'll show you over here in a moment, this, is, this marks the rising point of um, the Pleiades in the sky. So the idea with these kinds of structures was to be able to pick uh, where uh, the equinox, where the sun was during the equinox, the solstices and so on, and mark the rising and setting points of individual stars. The, uh, the idea also with this kind of structure was it's a little bit like an outside planetarium. The top of the structure here would form a false horizon. So if you stand in the centre and use the top of the structure as your horizon, it's a little bit like being in an outdoor planetarium, if you like. Excuse me. Uh, this is the causeway. This marks the uh, entrance. This is also known as the sun gate. So during the, uh, the equinoxes, the, when we have uh, equal night and equal day, the uh, sun rises over here and shines through this area here. And to ancient cultures, this was important because this was the time when they believed other realms would open and so on. So they really needed to know um, uh, when this time was. And <clears throat> Richard Hall was telling me he still gets druids and that come into uh, this place and they hold ceremonies. And he said he quite likes it because they're quite a colourful bunch. As you can uh, see the, uh, the causeway here, the gate of the sun, 
And um, so uh, I should have from the spring and the uh, autumnal equinox, not just the spring uh, equinox. Uh, now once you get in a little bit closer, this is the stone called the Tane stone. This marks, so if you're standing in the centre of the square and the sun is rising at the equinox, this is the stone, it rises just over the top of this stone uh, here. <coughs> this is the uh, analemma inside. Now for those of you that are kind of new, this obelisk here uh, at um, half an hour either side of um, uh, the local morning time there casts a shadow and it will show you the position of where the position of the sun is within these uh, zodiacal constellations on the ground here. Uh, this is about 10 metres long. The circle itself is about 30 metres across in diameter. And the obelisk, as I mentioned, is uh, 5 metres high. It would have been a mammoth task just building this for the Phoenix Astronomical Society. The Matariki, as I mentioned, where you stand here and you line up the, um, the uh, rising of the Pleiades, one of the great things I like about this is they have gone with that Māori theme, um, which uh, makes it interesting, I think, <coughs> for visitors. Now, these are the three um, hill stones that mark the rising of the sun, uh, and you've got three hill stones on the other side of the circle, and they again, they've related, uh, uh, Raumati is talking about the rising, so where, where the sun rises and so on. Tane is the god of the forest and so on, so this marked the equinoctus. Tani is also the king of humankind, and the name Tani is used for, for the male in uh, Māori culture. And Takurua, again, is referring to the rising point of the, um, uh, the three stars, belt stars of uh, Orion. <coughs> and now we're looking at the setting points of the uh, sun. The, uh, the winter solstice is marked by this star here, all right? The stone of uh, Hini Nui Te Po is the equinoxes, just there, or the post, I should say, of Hini Nui Te Po. Hini Nui Te Po, remember, is the goddess of death, goddess of the underworld. And so there is a story that talks about the sun had two wives. And so what he used to do was he'd move along the horizon throughout the year and move to the other wife. But when he got to one wife, he slowed down and stopped for a few days. And then all of a sudden he looked back and he could see his other wife and so he, he quickly moved back along the horizon, uh, back to the other wife. So he kept on going back and forwards from one to the other. <clears throat> all right, quickly looking at the Carter Observatory. The Carter Observatory is somewhat uh, analogous to the Mount Stromlo in Australia. It's, uh, they've got a larger observatory that does a lot more work now on the South Island. Uh, and uh, that's, um, I forget the exact name of the town, but uh, Carter was one of the first observatories, and it's in the national capital, a lot like Mount Stromlo is for uh, Australia. They do a lot of uh, work with the public, though. There are, uh, there's a nine and a three quarter inch refracting telescope here. The scope in here I didn't get to have a look at, unfortunately. But the main thing they do now is they have a nine metre planetarium, so they run planetarium shows. And they run really quite good planetarium shows. The, um, <clears throat> the other thing about visiting this place, and I highly recommend you visit it if you get the opportunity, is they have a great museum section there as well. And so they have all kinds of explanations and displays, as you can see. They have displays that talk about the Big Bang, that talk about galaxies, that talk about stars. They have displays that talk about the uh, Maori view, Polynesian navigation of the seas and so on, using um, the stars. So it really is quite, uh, quite good talking about the massive objects in space. Uh, it's, it's well worth a visit if you happen to end up in uh, Wellington. Uh, when uh, Maui brought the sun, uh, I beg your pardon, brought the island, the North Island up through the uh, water and so on, the um, guided by the sun and stars, again as I mentioned, talking about Polynesian navigation. <coughs> I mean, I'd love something like this at the Adelaide Planetarium, it'd be great to have something set up like this for uh, people. And as I mentioned, the planetarium itself is a nine metre dome. This is uh, uh, Claire, the lady who was responsible for bringing me over. She's originally from the Greenwich Observatory. And uh, they have a, a uh, 66 chairs in their planetarium. We have 47 here in Adelaide. And the operator actually sits up the back, all right? 
And the great thing is they can rotate the sky around and show you any part of the sky and so on. So they normally show a movie on the dome that runs for about 30 minutes and then they do about a 15 to 25 minute uh, planetarium presentation and show you around the sky and uh, so on. <clears throat> the, uh, there's Gordon Hudson, for those of you that remember Gordon that visited us a few years ago and uh, he was very proud of this telescope here. He does all the um, the work uh, like um, Blair and so on, he fixes the telescopes and uh, makes things, makes sure uh, things are running and he's refurbished a lot of the telescopes and he has done an incredible job on uh, these uh, scopes. This is believed to be one of the telescopes that Captain Cook brought down south when he was uh, journeying south. You can see it was made in 1750 by James Short and they were uh, famous um, uh, manufacturers of, of telescopes. This thing is really beautiful just to look at the refurbishment they've done on this telescope. You can see that it was originally built between 1866 to 1867 by Thomas Cook and Sons in uh, York and England. Uh, they were very prominent teles telescope manufacturers of the day. Brought to New Zealand in 1905 and it was placed in an observatory near Napier which is on the east coast of the uh, North Island. However, Wellington being the capital, they wanted a a, a large telescope, so they purchased it for £2,000, which in the day apparently was an awful lot of uh, money. What I didn't mention is, is the Wellington observatories. Wellington is fairly kind of flat, and then you've got all hills around it, and sort of up the top of one hill. And, and uh, Pam's having a chuckle there, she'd know if you walk up to it, it's very hard to walk up to, isn't it? It's walked very steep. It. You haven't walked up to it? No, no, you catch the cable car. <laughs> you catch the cable car, exactly, yes. Well, I was actually thinking of walking up to it, uh, but I drove up to it the first time, and uh, I was glad I drove up. It would have been a, a hard walk. And they do have a cable car that goes up to the observatory. So it was uh, installed in an observatory, uh, which is kind of across from uh, the observatory here, and then they moved it into this dome here, which is all pine, it's really, really nice. Photos don't always bring, uh, bring out, do these things justice. But Gordon Hudson did all the restoration on this uh, telescope. And Gordon is just a, a fountain of knowledge about the observatory and uh, the history of uh, this area. <coughs> well, to finish up with my talk, the, uh, on the very last day, I had a really busy day, because I was only there for a week and a half, you try and cram in as much as possible. And uh, I was so worn out the last day, and Gordon picked me up and he wanted to go out and do some sky viewing. He's got this uh, observatory in his backyard, which does a, an awful lot of uh, work. And uh, so he drove me out to his place, which is about a half an hour outside of um, Wellington. And um, I think it's, is it called Palmerston, Pam? It's Palmerston? Yeah. The suburb, and uh, he told me so much information about his telescope, but I was half asleep. And I actually said to him, Look, sorry, Gordon, I don't want to offend you. You're going to take me back to the motel, I need to sleep. Uh, so I, I had a bit of a quick look at his, his scope, but they do a lot of work uh, looking for supernovae, variable stars. Uh, he's got quite an active group. He runs the, excuse me, the Wellington group. There are two astronomical groups around Wellington uh, Gordon's group and also the Phoenix Astronomical Society. But, pardon? Uh, it, yeah, no, it's, it's a black kind of paint, but he told me so many details about the actual scope, and I'm sorry I've forgotten a lot of it now, but I've probably got a lot of it in notes. So I think I'll leave my presentation there. I just wanted to, hopefully it gives you an introduction to uh, how, how the Māori people see the night sky, and it gives you a little bit of an introduction to uh, the Carter Observatory, and if you end up in that part of the, the world, I highly recommend you, you visit uh, these places. It's, it's really quite interesting. Thank you.
So blame that. Yeah. Blame that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Paul, I was lucky enough to teach right down the bottom of the South Island for a year and there were auroras. Have the Maoris got any connection to auroras? They have stories, but I couldn't tell you what they are offhand. I'm sorry, Trish. I've, I've read some stories. Um, and I mean, Indigenous Australians have stories about them. Most uh, Indigenous cultures I've looked at, uh, auroras are normally omens of things, not good things are going to happen. <coughs> um, to give an example, some of the groups in Victoria uh, believe that when they see the red auroras, that's people that have been killed over the horizon and so on. Uh, as far as, far as uh, Maori stories, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions? Oh, well, you're very good at pronunciations. Thank you. <laughs> and I noticed that too when you uh, talk about um, uh, Australian Aboriginal words. How do you get that your tongue around if you practice? I mean, you I, I do actually. I, I, when I was there I met quite a few Maori people and I took over three hours of video and I probably should have brought it a little bit today um, but I was worried about running over time. But um, the, uh, I usually asked them and I filmed a lot of them speaking and uh, but with um, the uh, Aboriginal names and the Maori names, I, I write them down the way they sound to and uh, try and practice them that way. But they're probably not perfect, but yeah, yeah pretty well. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, that was actually a, a really interesting talk. I'm really pleased you gave it. But I'm never uh, more astounded by all the difference, nine different cultures, how they actually see the sky. I think we get a bit precious that uh, our viewing of the sky is the right one. Um, and uh, I think we've got to recognise there are a lot of other viewings of the sky. I always show kids the fact that uh, the Japanese use Subaru for what we call the Seven Sisters or Pleiades. There's so many different names, and I think we get very precious. So it's always great to hear what other cultures have done. So thank you very much. Thank you.